all this sounds cool, but I'm definitely going to need, need technology. This is not something I can keep track in a spreadsheet or, you know, do manually and be scalable. And do I need applications to also be written in a way that they can do fine grain authorization? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, if I think back 10, 15 years ago, everybody kind of did login on their own, right? Like they built that into their app. There was no, no, I, no such thing as externalizing your, you know, your authentication. Um, and so every application did it differently. Now, once you introduce standards, um, all of a sudden you at least had a shot of having, you know, kind of a single way of doing it. That wasn't enough though. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? <laughs> Not so bad. It was a little bit of delay there. Were you like thinking like, are you okay? <laughs> No, I'm I'm fine. I'm, it, potentially, my internet's going a little bit slow. I see the uploading in the background is a little bit laggier than normal, but hopefully everything's okay to have a conversation. Yeah, we're good. I've been having a fantastic day today, though. You know, you and I do a very similar role, right? We are focused on digital identity. We do consulting, right? We are advisors. We are paid to give our advice, which I always think is like the coolest thing. When <laughs> I is. give the explanation to people on what I do, I tell them I've been doing this for the last 12 years. And I've recently thought to myself, people probably think like, you haven't been promoted in 12 <laughs> years. How good are you at this? <laughs> but it's actually been that I've always kind of come back to this, right? I've had opportunities to be in higher roles, management or, growing the business and things like that. And I've stepped into some of those things, but I've always kept one foot on the advisory side. Um, one of the reasons is we just get so many opportunities to solve cool problems. And the one I was involved with today, someone got me involved in a conversation with a client um, and their, this particular client had a ton of PCI cardholder information in their network and they were wanting to understand like how do people normally go about you know building their identity strategy when they've got you know a normal non-pci network and then a um a zone a security zone with all their pci data in it and you know, normally what i've seen is like every organization is just like busting their hump to minimize the amount of cardholder data that they store. I tried mm -hmm. to kind of explain that, but it was just a fantastic conversation that I wasn't really expecting this morning to get into. And, um, but that's also one of the really cool things about working at a consulting firm like RSM is that we have so many like really smart people to tap into. Like, for mm -hmm. example, uh, the person that I was, you know, pulled me into this opportunity uh, was a QSA and I reached out to another person who I know is a QSA. So a QSA is a qualified security assessor in the area of PCI, right? It's like a certified person. Um, and so I was able to tap in and like, was my answer right? <laughs> he's like, absolutely. I mean, like, mm -hmm. that's what everybody's trying to do these days is like minimize the scope. And then within that, you adjust your strategy based on how big, how small can you get that scope? Can you get it to the point that you don't have any cardholder data on your network? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, I think that's the interesting thing about consulting is you can read as many books as you want, but a lot of it is based on experience and what you actually see in the real world because, you know, books are great, but it, it never survives the real world <laughs> when it comes to what people are doing and you know, legacy decisions that have been made and the reality of budgets and politics and, and all that good stuff. But do you feel, so you've been doing this 12 years, I've been doing this nine years. Do you feel like the advice you're giving now is better than 12 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> and why is that? Um, it's based on experience, right? I think mm -hmm. there is 
a misconception that a lot of people hold, which is, um, no, our peers don't think this, but <laughs> maybe other folks in our clients and prospective clients think, well, we should know everything. And look, my job prior to coming into consulting was at a bank. We've done consulting for credit card processing firms and lots of organizations that have PCI scope, right? But this particular situation was an even new one and you can't know everything. But what you can do, I think we do a really good job of this is like putting together a team of people who combined have all the right skills, have all the right knowledge and we ping things back and forth off of each other. So that mm -hmm. was, you know, it just, it, it made my day because it's like, Oh, this is really cool. This isn't something that I think about every day. I think about the identity side of things every day, but I don't think about the PCI side of things every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a thinking exercise and yeah, it's as man it sounds pretty cool. I think we had another conversation this morning. You and I were both on a call and it was, about the ownership or the accountability, where does IAM fall and what, what parts of an IAM program and things like that. And we kind of jokes like, oh, that's good. You know, we should probably bring this up on an episode. I feel like we talk about it every once in a while, but, um, and there's a lot of answers. I don't think there's a right answer. There's probably a generally accepted practice, but even that may not survive the realities of an organization or the politics involved and things like that. I feel like that's an episode unto itself. And I think the name of that episode is, just like Highlander, there's only one A. <laughs> I love it. That's what I yes. say. It's like I've, there can only be one. <laughs> I've heard you say it so many times now, right? It's like I even say it and I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I had I had another clever one this morning, at least clever to me. Oh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was built. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> but, but, you know, the thought that I was having, I was like wondering if other people were having this thought. It also fell. <laughs> it also it, collapsed. It so. did, but it was, <laughs> they stretched beyond their means. Okay, let's, yeah, let, come on. It was good at the time, and I'm going to stick with that one, you know, until someone starts yeah. shooting holes in it. So thanks, Jim. <laughs> let's talk about Yeah, well, you're right. Let's not, let's not drag, lag things out too much. Let's talk about the conferences that are coming up. Yeah, Identiverse is coming up May 28th to the 31st at the lovely Aria Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. You and I are going to be there. We've got discount code. ID or IDV 24 dash IDAC 25, you get 25% off. I think at this point, you've probably missed all the early birds, but hey, money saved is still money saved. So use that code, good way to support the show. Hopefully we'll see a lot of people out there that you and I know, I know that people are kind of excited for it. I think it's, I think it's probably the best identity conference, or maybe it's close to being the best. I'm not sure yet. And, you know, I think I'm looking forward to the, hallway conversations and things like that. So I'm hosting a panel out there. Uh, our friend Sean um, has asked me to do that. So we're going to talk about Cape. That's worth a thousand dollars right there. <laughs> yeah. Just to watch <laughs> me be up there and be the dumb guy on the stage while I'm asking all these really smart people about continuous access evaluation profile and like, uh, okay, so what does that mean? Can you explain it? Like I'm a fifth <laughs> grader because I totally don't get it. Um, but having conversations like that and all the hallway stuff, you and I are going to be podcasting sort of all over the place in different spot. Um, I know we have a room that we're going to be podcasting mostly out of. It's Copper Leaf something, but I don't have it in front of me. Copper Leaf 7. Copper Leaf 7. And we'll be recording, yeah. what, two to three per day in there? We're doing two on Tuesday morning. We're doing one on Wednesday, which will actually be in a different location. It's not official yet. And then we're doing three on Thursday. So Thursday is the day to... You know, if, you, if you're looking to see us live, meet us live, and it hasn't happened by Thursday, you know, Copperleaf 7 is the place to be. Pop your head in. You know, try to be quiet <laughs> for, for in the middle of, of recording an episode, stuff like that. But, yeah, we'd love to have people stop by and say hello. So is it the best identity conference? I, I don't know if it's the best, but it's definitely in the conversation. I don't think anybody who listens to this podcast would be – disappointed that discount code so if you haven't registered that discount code is the best one that's out there and i know that for a fact because i've seen all the discount codes there are none that are better than that so if you're thinking like i'm going to google for coupon code for identiverse actually you can do that ours will come up as part of the <laughs> answer generated by ai no no kidding is it um, all right cool yeah 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 so best code um we're going to be doing a bunch of different uh, events 
like after hours events, like we're co-sponsoring a happy hour with um, Talus. I think, you know, reach out to either one of us and get on that invite list. And plus, we'd love to meet you, you know, myself, Jeff, and several of our colleagues from RSM are going to be there. Um, and we would love to set time aside with you to talk about whatever, wherever you are in your IM cycle or, or in your IM journey, I should say. Mm. Good sales pitch there. Yeah, come come see us. RSM and Talus and Identity Center are all kind of combining forces. I think we're doing things a couple of nights. Um, and I think spaces are limited too. So definitely reach out um, and try to get on the list and hopefully we'll see you there. But if you see it just walking around, Jim, you've got a jacket you're going to be wearing a vest. I haven't, I don't know if I've seen it yet. I know we talked about it, but I don't remember what it was, but you've got something that you've, you're, you're yeah, planning. I, seen it. I know. No, no, okay. I've, I've, I've kept it hidden. I also okay. got a really cool pair of Nike shoes. So just watch out, man. Are they the kind that lace themselves? Cause that would be pretty cool. No, but you remember the type that had like a little basketball on the front and it was like, you could pump the, pump. the basketball and it would, now, see, I couldn't cool. afford the Nike ones. I had the Reebok pump. So I was super okay. cool in eighth grade. I had the Reebok pump. Okay. Well, I don't remember which ones were better or anything, but the whole pump idea was pretty cool. Anyway, they're not those, but they remind me of those. <laughs> okay. They're not those. They're not that thing that we just talked about, but it's something like that. Okay. <laughs> um, what about European, European Identity and Cloud Conference? That's coming up too. Right. It's like It's like the week after. So mm -hmm. June 4th through 7th in Berlin, uh, EIC IDAC 25 gets you 25% off. So if you are among the lucky people who can go there, but you also haven't registered yet, that's a fantastic discount code gets you 25% off. Yeah, it's super cool. And we'll have links in our show notes to be able to check that out. We got Identity Week after that. You want yeah, to talk about Identity, Identity Week after that. Let me do it. Let me do it. Let me run for it. it. All right. Identity week. All right. We'll do a Identity live. week Europe, <laughs> Amsterdam, June 11th and 12th. Identity week America, Washington, D.C., September 11th and 12th. Identity week Asia, Singapore, October 22nd and 23rd. We got one discount code works across all of those. IDAC 30 gets you 30% off. That's a pretty killer discount. Um, and Jeff, you and I will be at Identity week America. I think you're doing a panel. I'll be in the audience, like making funny faces and trying to distract you. <laughs> and you probably will, or maybe I'll call you out on it. I don't know. I, I seem to be settling into this panel hosting groove with having done it now. It'll be two or three times. So we'll see. It's like anything else. We'll get better at it as we go. But yeah, IDAC 30, you get 30% off. We'll have links in our show notes for all this stuff. So you don't have to remember them. Just click on the link either on our website or in your podcast app, whatever it may be. Um, all right. That's all the prep I think we need to do. We're going to talk about something called Auth Zen uh, and meditate on what that means. Sorry, I couldn't help it with the Zen there. Um, <laughs> to help us with that conversation, we've got Amri Gazit. He's the co-founder and CEO at Asserto, and he's one of the co-chairs of the Auth Zen working group at the OpenID Foundation. Welcome to the show, Amri. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. And thank you so much for taking the time with us. Uh, We'd like to find a little bit about your identity background. Tell us, how did you get into identity and access management or digital identity? Is it something that uh, you chose or did it choose you? Oh, gosh. Uh, I have to go back to, I would say, the early 2000s. Um, I was in Microsoft and we were doing, uh, I was leading the XML team at Microsoft. And one of the most exciting applications of XML was uh, SOAP, you know, this idea of sending messages across the internet between different components. And we started building out uh, a set of protocols uh, that were known uh, back then as WS star. And some people uh, like to call them later on WS death star uh, because they're uh, a little bit heavyweight, but among those were W security and W federation. And that really got me into, you know, this idea of how do we actually get kind of, all the protocols that we know about, you know, kind of in the old world, LDAP and like, you know, all these kind of like old internet protocols and kind of move them to the age of like the, you know, kind of like the, you know, interoperability across internet things uh, where you don't have a single trust domain. You have all these organizations that don't trust each other. They don't have a common Kerberos. And so all these protocols were developed at that time. SAML was developed around that, that time. 
my team was very heavily involved with that. So I would say that was how I got my start in the identity and access world. And that kind of led to, as we were starting the Azure platform, uh, we realized that we needed to go take uh, what was our core asset, Active Directory, and move it to the cloud. And so, you know, we had a Azure Access Control service that became Azure Active Directory. So yeah, like my uh, my roots are, you know, kind of date back to the early to mid uh, 2000. And now you're with a company called Asserto. Tell us a little bit about Asserto. What's the 30 second elevator pitch on what you guys do? So we like to say that identity moved to the age of SaaS and cloud, but authorization never did. And that's really what we're trying to solve with Asserto. We want to create uh, the definitive platform for authorization uh, in the age of SaaS and in the age of cloud. So just like you have today, you know, things like Okta and uh, Alt Zero and a bunch of different uh, platforms, developer platforms that make it so that you don't have to go build identity if you don't want to. You don't have to solve the login problem over and over again. There are services out there that just help you do that in a standards compliant way. That doesn't exist today with authorization. And so that was the challenge that we felt like was uh, the biggest challenge for both developers and organizations. You know, if you think about it, SSO solved a lot of problems for organizations. You, you, before you had all these SaaS apps, each one had its own user ID and password or email and like managing all that stuff was a mess. And today, you know, you basically have a single SSO platform and all your apps better hook up to that. You know, otherwise you won't even buy them, right? And so authorization is just this complete mess today where every application has its own admin screen and you have to kind of manage the permissions or the entitlements for each user separately. You have to do that for end users and M applications. And so that's the problem that we're trying to solve with Asserto. All right. That was a long elevator ride, but I think it was worth it. <laughs> um, I, was, I was snooping your LinkedIn profile and I noticed that for a time, you served as head of product for the Xbox platform. I was like, ooh, the gamer in me who just went, ooh, you know, cool. <laughs> um, and one of the keywords you mentioned in there was the Connect platform. And I always thought Connect was just a killer app and a killer, you know, functionality that the Xbox had, but it never really seemed to take off, I think, is, is what probably people were hoping. But now we're seeing a lot of motion-based controls, right? Apple Vision Pro has it. Phones have it. It's kind of... In, in, a, in a spot right now where people are starting to kind of get it, I guess, take me behind the scenes a little bit. How did, you know, how did Connect come around? And is it just a matter of the world wasn't quite ready for it? Was it the hardware wasn't quite powerful or the software? Maybe it was a combination of kind of everything and just wasn't quite the right time for it. Yeah, that's uh, that takes me to the time, the only time in my career where my kids could actually say, I know what you do with that. <laughs> um, this identity stuff, they don't get it. They're like, are you like responsible for all of those like two factor, like all these codes, like, oh my God, that's so hard. That's so ter ter terrible. But, you know, the Xbox was kind of fun. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the Kinect, the vision was you are the controller. And there was just a ton of really advanced engineering that went into it. Um, a lot of machine learning actually went into it. So this idea of creating this mic array, you know, that had... Uh, four different mics that could uh, map out the room and, you know, uh, like beamform effectively, like all of the, you know, what your, you know, where your voice was coming from and um, be able to uh, attenuate, like, so, you know, obviously uh, voice attenuates with a square of distance, um, just like any wave. And so having a model that could actually understand you from nine feet away was completely unheard of at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like the best models were like phone models where you're talking, you know, kind of like a few inches away. That was a huge problem. The acoustic models, then the language models, that was another problem. Uh, and then of course the, uh, the motion sensing was a huge uh, step forward too. So what we had was we had an RGB camera and a depth camera. And in the beginning, we were trying to get people like developers, game developers are unbelievable engineers, right? Like the best engineers that exist on this planet. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, well, you're giving me like lots of data, but I don't really know what to do with it. So we actually had to build another sure. library, a skeletal tracking library that could map out 18 joints in your body 
and give you kind of a vector for what those drones were doing. And it was only in, like at that point that people could actually start building experiences and games for this thing. Now, you know, why didn't it succeed? It actually succeeded like at the time we sold 7 million units in the first couple wow. of months. And it was unbelievable. It was just like the fastest consumer electronic, you know, thing that, you know, kind of was sold at the time. But definitely the paradigm, the paradigm of you are the controller didn't quite, quite like I would say take off in the way that we wanted it to. I think some of that was just that, you know, AAA hardcore gaming is still done with a controller. You know, like mm -hmm. you're basically, you're talking about the people really good at it. They don't even want a cordless, a wireless controller. They want a wired controller because that cuts latency. They want to mm -hmm. actually put their Xbox or whatever they're playing on on a on a on an Ethernet cord because even the ping times, like you know, like really matter when it comes to like mm -hmm. playing first person shooters. So that audience was never really going to embrace the Connect, and I do think that the technology has gotten a lot better since then. So we're starting to see all of that reemerge, and a lot of these things, you know, they they tend to take their time, right? So. You see the first uh, examples of some innovative new technology really 10 years, maybe even 15 years before it actually gets completely adopted. So yeah, uh, you're taking me back to, you know, old, <laughs> old days and, and a lot of fun engineering. Well, I, you know, I felt like I just had to ask that question why I had you here. I was like, all right, you know, this is such a cool concept back then. And yeah, I, I'm, I, I, I get it. And I thought, it, you know, I was like, oh, this is really revolutionary for the time. And I was like, okay, I can't wait to see more of this. And, you know, it's, it's like anything else, right? It, it starts one place and then it maybe matures and evolves and, and, and so forth. But we're not the Xbox Connect podcast. We're the Identity podcast. So I want to ask you about AuthZen. What is AuthZen and what does that name even mean? Yeah. Uh, so we basically, uh, you know, let me pick up the theme around standards in the authorization space. So it's not like we haven't had standards. You know, if you go back to the early 2000s, we had ExactMo, uh, and we had other things in the space. But uh, we've noticed that there's a lot of innovation that's happening with authorization over the last five years. You have uh, projects like Open Policy Agent, and you have papers like Google Zanzibar paper. But you know, and there's like probably a dozen different implementations now that are all trying to solve the problem of how do you know whether a user, Jeff has this permission on this object. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways of asking the question and none of them are interoperable. And so one of the things that we noticed was, yeah, this kind of reminds us of the identity space. You know, if we remember the time where like, you know, you had Google and Facebook and Microsoft had its passport and you had all these different people that were trying to help you log in. And it wasn't until they all kind of moved to a common protocol that developers could say, well, I'm going to write it once and it's going to work with all these, these different, you know, internet uh, identity providers. Uh, that was kind of like this uh, trigger point that really helped that industry start coalescing, you know, the uh, standards-based identity industry. And so we feel like the same thing can be true for authorization. There are a few of us that have been talking about this for a while. Our conversation started uh, actually gained steam after Identiverse of 2023. And we said, hey, let's go get together and define a charter and figure out what, where we want to do this work. So we took it to the OpenID Foundation, uh, the same foundation that did OpenID Connect. And I like to say, OpenID Connect was where single sign on on the web really kind of like hit a hockey stick, right? So if you talk to uh, Mike Jones, who has been around, uh, is, was one of the original contributors to OpenID Connect and worked at Microsoft for many years, they'll say that 97 or 98% of the logins that Microsoft does are based on OpenID Connect. So incredible penetration within the industry. And we want to have our OpenID Connect moment for authorization. And so that's why it made total sense to bring that to the OpenID Foundation, the same organization that uh, you know, kind of codified OpenID Connect. And so we started a working group there. Uh, I was one of the co-founders and now one of the co-chairs. And we've made some really good progress on it. The Zen, you know, is a little bit apocryphal. So we thought, Auth Z, we need something kind of like that is, you know, kind of rings off the tongue. Somebody 
proposed Zen, and I don't even remember what the E and the N stand for, but Ob Zen kind of stuck. So we don't even remember what it stood for, but uh, you know that's what we're called now. Cool story. I'm going to ask you the hardest question of the day. Let's see how you do. What is authorization? So authorization is the process of determining that um, you have permissions to uh, perform a certain action on a certain resource. Uh, so in the old days, I mean, people use the term permissions to describe the same thing. People use the term entitlements. Uh, but, you know, if identity or a login or authentication is the process of proving that you are who you say you are, then authorization is the process of figuring out what you can do within the context of this application based on the permissions or the roles that you got granted. That's a good answer. One of the things I always find really hard to explain or even hard to answer, okay, is this authorization? So we talk about an account that has these groups, roles, entitlements, whatever you want to call them. Is that authorization or is it, Oh, is it authorization only when I go to try to use those things? That's a fantastic question. And really, the uh, there are really two processes here. There's something that you do like to set things up, right? So like you're basically going to assign a user to a role, you know, or uh, put them in a group or give them a permission. And that's something that you do as an admin. Or one of the other scenarios is, you have a Google Doc and you add Jeff as a viewer of that doc. That's the process of kind of setting up the permissions, like granting or delegating a permission to someone. Now, the process of authorization is actually checking. So when Jeff goes to open that document, authorization is really the service or the process that determines that Jeff actually has read access to this document and therefore can open it. Yeah, it, it, I've always felt like authorization is inextricably tied to authentication. Would you agree with that? I think it's downstream from authentication. The two things are often very confused, and it doesn't really help that some of the authentication uh, you know, specs like OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, uh, especially OAuth 2, they talk about things as authorization delegated authorization, the idea of if I'm logging in, uh, you know, if I'm basically, I, I want to delegate access to uh, some application to something that Google manages for me, like a Google Doc, you know, the user basically has to grant their permission. So that process is in some way a delegated authorization process. But OpenID Connect is just a login process. And so, you know, these things are muddled together. Uh, and that's a very confusing thing, but using an authentication system for authorization is considered an anti-pattern because at authentication time, I don't know what you can do within the system. Like imagine, for example, Google, you know, wanted to implement authorization by, you know, at, at login time, they would say, okay, well, Jim just logged in to Google docs. Let's see. Which documents does Jim have access to? Could be 10, could be hundreds, could be thousands. And somehow I'm going to go figure all that stuff out at login time, which shouldn't take too long, and then put a claim in an access token that corresponds to the fact that Jim actually has access to this document. Well, even if you did that, even if it took a reasonable amount of time, not like any, a huge amount of time, as soon as you minted that access token, and you try to use it, and you try to figure out whether Jim actually has access to this document before allowing him access, Jim may have like gained access two seconds ago, whereas the access token may have been minted two hours ago. So all of that information is by definition stale. And so this idea of authentication really needs to be focused on, is Jim who, who they say they are, right? Can Jim prove it? Jim has a password. Jim has, you know, like a biometric, Jim has a pass key, Jim has some way of proving that Jim is Jim. But the process of authorization really needs to be downstream for that. Now that we know that Jim is who he says he is, let's go figure out whether Jim has access to this document at this time. And that's a very distinct process, the process of authorization. I really appreciate you going through that. And I think for folks who 
you know, it, that was going too fast. Like, back it up, listen to that again. It really breaks down the difference between authentication and authorization. If you start running into some of these terms that you're maybe not familiar with, like claims, I was going to throw another one out there, grants. You know, you hear these terms used all the time. And go ahead and look those up. Just start to educate yourself. And eventually, next time you hear it or the time after that, it'll start to make sense. Um, again, great background, Omri. And what I wanted to ask you next was kind of like authorization. It's been around in identity for as long as I've been in identity, which is over 20 years. Can you give us a little history of authorization through the years of identity? Yeah, I mean, we can go back many decades to mandatory access control and discretionary access control, which are kind of like the kind of the OGs in the space. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, mandatory would be like, I'm assigning you to a particular role as an admin, and you can only do the things that this role grants you. Discretionary is really, I can actually delegate access to some resource that I own to somebody else, right? So those two concepts are, I think, you know, kind of core concepts within the idea of access control. So if you think about the old Unix world, the old Unix world had, you know, everything was a file, right? And files had uh, user and group and other. And then each one of those like had read, write, and execute bits. So you had a total of nine bits that determined access control on a file. So for example, as a user, as an owner of the file, as an owner, I could have a read, a write, or an execute bit on that file. And then um, I, I would have that on groups and for others as well. And so that was the level of granularity that you had for access control. And that was, you know, kind of like a, a simple system because everything that you needed to secure access to at the time on a Unix system was a file. Like everything was modeled as a file. Everything on a Unix system or a Linux system is an inode. And so that model was kind of a, a prevalent model, I would say, through the 80s and maybe a little bit of the 90s. And then, you know, you start getting into directories. So LDAP and Active Directory kind of brought in this idea that you had users that could belong to groups and groups could be nested. And so all of a sudden you could say, okay, well, if Jim is a member of the you know, sales group, then you know, that means that he is, has a, a, a role, a sales role in Salesforce or in whatever application you know, like, uh, was around in the 90s. I think Salesforce started in the early 2000s. Um, so you know, things like PeopleSoft or <laughs> SAP or mm -hmm. things like that, right? The, the good old uh, enterprise software days. So that was the idea of role-based access control. So the, you know, the idea that you know, if I assigned you to a group, that group corresponded to a role, and that role gave you some set of permission. They were typically fairly, you know, coarse grain permissions, but they were still, that's kind of like the way that people organized. Now, the problem with that was that, you know, you ended up having lots and lots of groups because every application defined its own group, right? So when I left Microsoft in, I think it was 2011, we had about, let's call it 100,000 employees, and we had 300,000 groups. So no one could actually reason about who had access to what. Um, you know, like you basically you had a new app, you created groups for it, you put users in it, and like you had no idea whether these groups were still used. I mean, it was kind of a mess. And so then you got to this idea of fine-grained access control and specifically this idea of attribute-based access control. That got started in the early 2000s. Everybody kind of, most people have heard of SAML, the security assertion markup language that got started in 2001. The idea of essentially doing single sign-on on the web that, you know, kind of eventually gave way to OpenID Connect, and that's what most, most of us use. But there was a much lesser known spec at the time that started around the same time called ExactMol. So it stood for XML access control markup language. And the idea was, hey, instead of doing these roles, let's actually grant attributes to everybody and hopefully share these attributes, right? So Jeff has an attribute called department and you know, he also has an attribute, you know, um, a manager or not, right? Or you know, a number of different things. We're in the military, you could have Jeff has a top secret attribute. And then if you look at resources, they may have attributes too, 
So if you have a document that has a top secret attribute, only people with a top secret attribute, like as part of their attribute set, can actually read that document. That makes a lot of sense if you know all of these attributes can be shared. But what ended up happening was I just had at last I done a verse, somebody came up to me from the you know the defense uh, you know area and he said, so yeah, attribute based access control. Guess how many attributes we have on our on our principles? I said how many? He goes guess. I say hundred. He goes keep going. I say thousands. He says keep going. It's like forty thousand attributes. <laughs> and so you're not much better than groups, you know, honestly, when you're essentially using attributes the same way that you use groups. And the last evolution of this is what I call relationship-based access control. So this is what Google repopularized with the Zanzibar paper. So Zanzibar is the system that they use internally for doing access control on Google Docs and Google Drive and Calendar and Google Cloud and a bunch of Google properties. And the idea is this kind of like remix between access control lists and, and roles. So if you've ever used Google Drive or Google Docs, you know what I'm talking about. So if Jim is a member of the engineering group and the engineering group is an owner of the engineering folder and the you know, roadmap document is, uh, you know, is parented by the engineering folder, then Jim has a path from Jim, through the group, through the folder, all the way to the document that carries that read permission. So Jim can open the file because Jim is, you know, like, you know, kind of we've walked the graph of relationships. And so you can create these simple roles like owner or viewer or commenter or, you know, editor on these documents or folders, right? And you can assign them to people and that helps you kind of, uh, you know, create a much more succinct way of expressing who has access to what. Um, so that would be relationship-based access control. And most of the companies, uh, the modern companies in the uh, authorization space are now, they have some form of either attribute-based or relationship-based access control. And our company, Asserto, uh, through our open source project, Topaz, actually combines them both. So that's, uh, you know, the kind of the evolution in five minutes of uh, the access control models. Yeah, you know, and you brought up a, a lot of points there. You brought, talked about ExactMol, uh, which, you know, that's really was my big exposure early on in my identity career and looking at that. Um, I think a lot of those roles that are defined within that standard still make sense today in terms of like policy decision point policy um uh enforcement point enforcement point yep enforcement point thank you hey every once in a while yeah i read a, that book little, too <laughs> uh, a little lapse um but you know what's really gotten me excited uh recently was policy-based access control and i'm going to throw this out there because there may be a misunderstanding on my part but i've always thought identity systems would build an authorization model based on data that it had within its purview. And when you start going into a policy-based access control framework, now all the data within your enterprise becomes available to build policies around. So here's the scenario. You don't have within your identity systems information about account balances, right? That's back in some business system but you may want to create a role or a grouping or allow people to access something based on the fact that they have, you know, policy balances in excess of say $50,000. It's a black and white question, but that data is outside of your realm and you don't want to keep a synchronized copy of that data locally, right? You just want to basically have some kind of API call a policy around it and it's either a yes no question i think that's kind of revolutionary and to me that was like okay that's one of the things that's making authorization so hot what do you think yeah um i think from so if you look at identity you know and law and specifically authentication you could define it with a small uh, set of protocols because it's mostly 
you know, kind of a fairly constrained problem. But authorization, as you said, is really a combination of data that you have about people and group membership and things like that. That's like common to all these applications and then application specific data. And you kind of want to bring these things together. So in your example, um, you know, things like balances, my, my favorite example for that is uh, you have a approval limit. So managers tend to have approval limits, or if you are in the financial services or insurance industry, you may have as a claims adjuster, a, an approval limit, and you have an, some kind of claim that comes in. And if the claim is underneath, under the approval limit, then you can uh, approve it. Otherwise you can't. And that's a perfect example of a policy-based um, authorization decision. Now, oftentimes, these systems are implemented using ABAC models, attribute-based access control models. So the attribute of the resource, in this case, the claim, would be, well, it's 20,000. And the attribute of the user, in this case, Jim, the claims adjuster, is approval limit is 50,000. And so you can write a policy that has simple logic in it. It says... Essentially, that says if the you know claim is under the approver's limit, then allow, otherwise deny. And so that's why I would say that policy-based um, systems have grown you know out of the the attribute-based access control world. Um, and the 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 most exciting thing actually is you can combine these models. So you could basically say hey, I want to um, grant Jim access to this document um, if Jim has a viewer relationship to this document, but also if it's during business hours or, but also if Jim is not, you know, on the disabled user list. And so those scenarios are scenarios where you're combining this idea of relationships and the idea of attributes, uh, whether they are environmental attributes or attributes about the user or attributes about the user. Why do you think that mo other areas of identity have matured quicker than the authorization space? So I think about things like the authentication space, access management, identity governance administration, and access reviews, and onboarding, and automation, and privileged access management. I mean, it seems like those areas have either matured or maybe evolved faster than the authorization space. Is this just because this is the way the train is built? You kind of had to start at the front door, get people in through authentication, and then start to think about, okay, well, how does that all work? And then we get to authorization, I guess. What's working now that didn't work before that makes now the time to solve the authorization issue? Yeah, I think that we've now gotten to the point where people are ready for this idea of the principle of least privilege or zero standing privileges. These are all, I, I don't love to use the terms because they sound too buzzwordy, but the basic idea here is that most people in organizations are over provision. Most people have, uh, are a member of a role that gives them more access than they need to. They have a bunch of different roles. This whole idea of recertification you know, like every year an organization goes through every personnel and figures out whether the roles that they have are still the roles that they should have. And it's like a manual, error-prone, soul-crushing experience for everybody involved, right? Um, it's all because we just grant like a whole bunch of permissions to people because that's all we can do. And that comes from this kind of what we call the anti-pattern of using your authentication system for authorization. So for example, if, all, if the only tool I have in my tool chest is, well, Jeff's a salesperson, so he gets to access Salesforce. That's it, that's all I have. Like um, I can do that with an IGA system, um, but that's probably not everything I need you know, if we really want to go lock down the system, I want to be able to allow Jeff only to access a set of records that either, you know, correspond to, you know, kind of his customers or his manager should be able to look at all the people underneath them. But, you know, perhaps not everything else. The VP of sales should be able to look at, you know, all the forecasts. Um, you know, everybody should have access according to their the needs of their role. And today we're just not there. And that's what... Um, you know, authorization systems or fine-grained authorization system, systems, that's the promise they, they hold. 
And I really do feel like both from a capability and a technology perspective, we're finally at the point where the technology can, you know, kind of really deliver on the requirement. And then you ask where the requirement comes from. You know, I think we've all seen like the horror stories of breaches, you know, like some identity got breached, it was over provisions, the user, the, the, you know, kind of the, the, um, the, the actor was able to uh, penetrate the system, do a lot more than they would have if the user had uh, a much smaller set of privileges. And so that's why I think organizations are starting to get really interested in, okay, so how do we really solve this problem of like over-provisioned access? Omri, the, one of the, okay, so identity is about ensuring that the right people have the right access or having a one place to go to know who has access to what. And I kind of feel like when that access is very dynamic, maybe that paper trail isn't there. That's a concern for me. I, I, well, I think we can be more secure by making it more dynamic. I, I, I worry that there's a, a disconnect in terms of the audit trail of who had access at this specific moment in time. Yeah, I think that's an excellent observation. And in fact, most of the authorization products I know make it a point to gather fine-grained decision logs. So every time a PDP, a policy decision point in the parlance, makes a decision as to whether Jim, you know, um, has access or not, it will log that. It will basically say, it was Jim. This is the policy we used. This is the version of the policy we used. This is the data that we used to make that decision so that you can actually have full audit trails uh, for compliance and for forensics. So if Jim's, you know, identity was compromised in some way and somebody came in and tried to do some things, we don't just know that, you know, like the, uh, you know, the bad actor logged in. We also know exactly what they did and what they were granted access to and what they were denied access to after the fact. And you could, you know, project that forward even more and say, okay, well, in the age of AI, we could actually go do some, you know, kind of uh, anomaly detection and go, huh, well, it looks like we can derive some risk signal because Jim, the engineer, just logged into the sales system. That doesn't sound right. So let's actually go, um, you know, kind of add that signal to the decision uh, process in the policy decision point. Say, hey, you know, we're going to flip a bid, you know, like suspicious and start failing some of these authorizations in real time. So I think having a real time system that has a data exhaust that you can actually use both reactively and proactively really does help you with this problem. It strikes me that the more back you get into this, meaning, you know, I think everybody's familiar with our back and roles and sort of that's where we've been. But now we're looking at things like attribute based access control, policy based access control, relationship, relationship based access control, that those backs require technology to keep that footprint in place, to keep that audit trail in place, to keep, you know, the receipts and to make this manageable for people, which leads me to my, I guess my second thought here is that what is the responsibility or the maturation of applications and do they need to be constructed in a way that they do support these, this level of granularity with permissions? Because, you know, the, the old days, right, right? Like we're all old here. It's like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, right? Apps were built on, you know, yes, no, or a single group. But now you see some advanced applications, notably like ERP applications, for example, have these giant matrices of, yes, this role can do these specific transactions or functions, whatever it may be. It was almost like it was designed for attribute-based or policy-based or relationship-based access control, where some applications just... They can't support that. And so either you have to create a number of groups to support that, <laughs> which, you know, maybe that's maybe that's what happens a lot of times, or maybe it's just not the right fit from a control method to use for that specific application. I guess, what are your thoughts on that idea of like, okay, all this sounds cool, but I'm definitely going to need, need technology. This is not something I can keep track in a spreadsheet or, you know, do manually and be scalable. And do I need applications to also be written in a way that they can do fine grain authorization. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, if I 
think back 10, 15 years ago, everybody kind of did login on their own, right? Like they built that into their app. There was no, no, I, no such thing as externalizing your, you know, your authentication. Um, and so every application did it differently. Now, once you introduce standards, um, all of a sudden you at least had a shot of having, you know, kind of a single way of doing it. That wasn't enough though. It wasn't until developers incorporated that into their applications that you really ended up with, like imagine a world in which you had Okta, but you didn't have any applications that talked to the protocols that Okta talks to. What good would, you, would your single sign-on system be? Not, not so very good, right? So there's gotta be a tipping point where enough applications are compliant, so to speak, or integrate within with your bus, with your authorization control plane for that authorization control plane to make sense. And that brings us all the way back to the world of standards. How do you actually get to the tipping point? Well, you have to convince developers that building, that using an externalized authorization system is actually less work than building all of that spaghetti logic, the if statements, the switch statements, the stuff that's completely unmaintainable, the stuff that really kind of hurts your soul <laughs> when you have to like change it. Um, instead, like if you delegate it to an external system and you have those, those authorization rules really written as a set of rules, as a policy, all of a sudden you get out of this game of having to like maintain all this logic. And from what we like, from what we've read, like 10 to 20% of application logic is like this crazy authorization logic. So developers don't want to do it, right? Like, have you ever heard a developer say, hey, I want to build rules and RBAC into an application? Said no developer ever, right? They just don't have the tools to be able to do it. And so there is a chicken and egg thing here. And if we give them better tools that like work with a bunch of different vendor systems, then we now have a shot of having developers join the party. And once developers join the party, then that gives you the ability to say, okay, I have a single authorization control plane that I can use to control the entitlements or you know, kind of the permissions of multiple applications. And that's the vision that we're trying to uh, you know, kind of drive towards. And it sounds like uh, you know, kind of pie in the sky, far off vision. But I'll remind you that 10 or 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't have things like OpenID Connect and every app did log in its own way. And so we were back in that like crazy world where every, like admins had to like manage, you know, N different, you know, like credentials for all their users because none of these systems talk to each other. So yeah, that's exactly where we're trying to, to, to go. And your observation is exactly on point that developers had to have to to get on board. And the only way they get on board is if you make it easier than if they just did the path, the previous path of least resistance. Yeah. Easier. And they, and they see the benefit of doing it. Right. Exactly. And if you so ask me why it hasn't happened yet, it's exactly because it's been too hard. I mean, you go back and look at exactly. I mean, it's a bunch of XML, like my team worked on it. So I can say this, but it's a language that only a mother could love. You know I mean? It's, no developer wants to actually write that the angle bracket. So I think that's where 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 we have better tools now. Right. So Omri, we really appreciate the time that you've given to us and our listeners today. A large portion of our listeners are the I am practitioners of the world. In other words, they're making this stuff actually work in the real world. And what I'd like to do, ask you to do is kind of like put yourself in their shoes and kind of talk about um, a right-sized approach to authorization. So imagine you, you just got the job of your dreams for the company that you love, and you're, gonna, you're supposed to go in there and get authorization humming. And the first thing you come in is to realize that there is like the authorization today is just a bunch of active directory groups. They're a total mess. You know, maybe there's an IGA, but it's not doing any kind of RBAC. There's no, any kind of advanced uh, authorization tool. What, what's kind of that maturity cycle look like? Yeah. So I'm a big believer in, you know, kind of building things incrementally. So 
the first thing is you gotta you gotta understand where you're at and start there. And most organizations, if they have anything at all, is gonna be some group based RBAC thing. They have an Active Directory or an Azure AD or something, you know, an LDAP or some um, you know way of managing users and groups. And that's a good start. You know, like that, that's, that's a place where you can at least, you know, start from. And if you then have a, a couple of lighthouse applications, start small, start with like an app that you know that you can actually control and say, you know what, we're going to go build an authorization system for my organization now. Um, and we're going to start hooking up some apps to it. And, you know, if you could basically have a very simple onboarding for your developers and you say, okay, well, you know, you're basically going to talk to this authorization system to get whether, like to, to get whether this user is a member of this group. Now you have this clearinghouse, this, you know, kind of authorization service that becomes the nexus for making these decisions. And for every application, you can basically create its own model. Um, so, you know, some applications have, most applications are going to have users and groups, but some applications are going to have, you know, like if it's an applicant tracking application, it'll have candidates and it'll have job descriptions. If it's an ERP system, you know, it'll have whatever products, you know, you have, or, um, you know, you basically will create a model for each one of these things and you'll be able to assign those users and groups to, you know, kind of the, you know, kind of be owners or viewers or editors of those particular assets, you know, within the system. So I think that the work here is not to like try to do this big bang thing and take five years. It's to just basically start with this idea that we're going to centralize our authorization models and like go work with, uh, you know, some number of applications that you have control over or, act, or at least influence over and see if you can get some quick wins. And a lot of customers that we work with have done exactly that. They'll have a Lighthouse app. They'll prove out the concept. They'll then say, okay, now we're going to build uh, more apps around this central authorization system. And they'll, that's how they'll kind of build success. What's a Lighthouse app? Um, Lighthouse is, I mean, maybe it's a Microsoftism, but we used to say like, this is kind of like the exemplar or kind of like, Everybody knows this app. Back in Microsoft, we used to have this app called HeadTrax. HeadTrax was like the way that you, the corporate directory viewer, right? So everybody knew what HeadTrax was. And so if you could get HeadTrax to do something, if you could get it to like do a single sign-on through Azure Active Directory, boy, that was something because everybody in the company used HeadTrax every day. And so, you know, like if you could get like one of those, you know, kind of very popular, very well-known applications within your environment, to be able to support something new, then that shows people the way. And it now shows them the benefit of using that. Hence the, hence the lighthouse, right? Shining the light. <laughs> exactly. So you've been generous with your time and, and I promised that we'd let you get on with your, with your day and your evening. Um, we were talking before we hit record and you mentioned that you um, are into Kung Fu, <laughs> which I find super interesting. We, we've had martial arts kind of on the show before. Um, I think I've mentioned I've studied Taekwondo way a long, long, long time ago. So I've probably forgotten everything at this point. Um, but I want to ask you about Kung Fu, I guess, how did you get into it? And then how it has it influenced other areas of your life? Is there some sort of um, process that kind of has permeated beyond just what you've learned in Kung Fu and said, oh, I can take this into this other aspect of my life? Yeah, I got into it completely randomly. I was on a sabbatical for Microsoft and my wife decided I was going to do, you know, a few different things, uh, but none of them included a computer. And um, so I, she signed me up for two weeks free, you know, Kung Fu classes uh, at a local dojo that was just getting started. And I didn't really know what I want, uh, want to get out of it. I just thought it would be cool and really kind of fell in love with it. And uh, so it's interesting. One of the, like the journey has been kind of an interesting journey. Uh, I, uh, when I tested for my black belt test, I failed that test. And I remember um, the, you know, the, the, the senseis, the masters that were testing us for black belt, which is a big deal. It was like, it took, you know, five years to get there. And 
it was a very long test. It was like seven or eight hours, uh, very physically demanding. And they asked me, you know, kind of at the very end, would it, you know, would you feel like it was all worth it if you, if the belt that we put in front of you uh, is a black belt or the same belt that you had before? Um, and I kind of had to think about it, reflect. And I was like, you know, it really is about the journey. Of course, I want to get the belt, but it's not about the result or it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. And I could, you know, like load myself with a straight base and say, no, like if I don't get the black belt, then I actually feel like you have good quality control. And, um, you know, that, uh, that, that I just want to keep going at it and get better at it. And it turns out that they, there are two other people that tested for their black belt and all of us failed the test. They, you know, they wouldn't quite come out and say you failed. I'm like, no, it's cool. You told me I failed. Like, I'm good with that. Like, I, what I want is I want you to help me kind of figure out how to get better. And mm -hmm. that happened to me for my third degree test as well. I just got my fourth about, you know, I think it was two or three years ago. So I've been on this journey for going on 20 years now, but it really is about the journey. And the belts matter a lot less than, you know, kind of developing as a martial artist. And I think that's a great metaphor for like, you know, certainly in my career, I've had times where I've, I was obsessed with this promotion or with this job or whatever. And Kung Fu, I would say, helped me kind of contextualize that and go, you know, really life is a journey. It's really about all the experiences you can gain. As a startup founder, you know, you have to have that kind of mentality because there's a lot of highs and a lot of lows and you got to make sure that you're in it for the journey because you're not in it for the glamour. You're not in it for the money for the most part, unless you, you know, kind of somehow manage to, uh, you know, to hit a home run. Uh, so what are you in it for? You're in it for the journey. And I think uh, I definitely internalized that from, from Kung Fu. Well, yeah. I mean, if everybody has a black belt, then what's the, you know, it doesn't really signify anything <laughs> at, at that level. Um, I think one of the things that I learned, you know, going through the Taekwondo side was discipline and consistency. And, you know, I, I only did it for a few years kind of actively, but, uh, you know, it was the best shape I ever got in my life. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, but the idea of day in, day out repetition, and you may not see results in a day or two days, but then all of a sudden you look back and that journey that you mentioned a month later, two months later, three months later, it's like, oh, wow, I, I, I you know, I, I could only kick so high. Now I can kick this high or, you know, I could only develop this much force with a certain type of strike. And now I'm developing so much force or I'm not just hurting myself. <laughs> we used to have a saying, I don't know if this is true um, from from your studies as well, but the most dangerous belt in the world is the white belt because you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there was something similar <laughs> on the Kung Fu side, but we talked about that in Taekwondo a lot. <laughs> was there something similar yeah, on the Kung sure. Fu side? Um, I, I, my favorite phrase is a black belt is a white belt who never quit. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Jim, yeah. what about what martial arts that you have you worked on, Jim? No martial arts, but when Omri was telling his story, it kind of reminded me of when I was in my MBA program. And I remember taking the first couple of classes and thinking if I could just give them the $60,000 and they would give me to the degree, I would take that deal. Then by the time I got to the end, and it took me six years to finish it. I said, the only thing that matters is what I learned. You can take the degree off the wall and throw it in the trash, really, because nobody cares that I have an MBA, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nice and all. It looks good on my wall, but it's what I learned during that process that made it what it's worth. And there's different and ways to learn. That got me right? thinking of, what's that? I said, there's different ways to learn, too, right? For you, your path was an MBA. And for some people, that's not the path. Like they learn other ways. And I think you just threw something really important there. It's like the paper on the wall is nice, but it shouldn't be like, oh, this is how you certify that you know it, right? Amri, you talked about like the black belt. It's like, you knew it. You know, maybe there were things that weren't quite up to black belt level at the time, but it's not like, it's not like you forgot it when you didn't get it, <laughs> right? You still knew it. And I would imagine the same thing for yeah. you, Jim. It's like, you still knew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what was worth, was how it changed me. And then my other thought was what I like to do for fitness is work out. And there's really no like trophies or recognition for 
working out. And as I've changed, and I've, I've changed a lot in 10 years, right? I see that in myself. The working out really hasn't changed, but what I get out of it change, has changed over time. And what I get out of it nowadays, it's going to sound so simple. I just like doing it. I just <laughs> like working out. You like and to feel the burn? So it's my enjoyment. <laughs> I do it for enjoyment, and I'll never get a trophy or I'll never get any recognition by somebody else. And nobody 30 years from now is going to be like, oh, man, you used to work out so great. I just do it because I enjoy it. And that that's not, you know, when I first started, I was like, oh, I feel overweight and I want to look a certain way. And then it evolved to, well, now I'm actually starting to look better. Now I want to feel better, right? There's some aches and pains in my body and we want to work on that. But now it's gotten to the point where I just do it for fun. And I think a lot of people will be, maybe not surprised, but this is something that's always impressed me about you, Jim. I'm going to give you a compliment is your consistency to it. Like, you know, we've been on the road traveling, you know, we work all the time together and it's like, okay, day's over. Jim goes and does his workout, whether we're traveling on the road or whatever. And then we meet up for dinner <laughs> kind of after that, but you put in the time and you put in the work, even, you know, even when it's maybe not convenient, which, which is really admirable. I think, thank you. Thank you. And I think that's, I think that's important. If you really want to get good at something, it's consistency. Like I know mm -hmm. you were doing a lot with the guitar and I think if you just stay with it for I suck whatever it. <laughs> amount of years it takes, you're going to like knock yourself out with how far you get with it. See, that's my problem is I'm not consistent with it. And uh, you know, the one thing I have been consistent with is learning how to like edit. So, you know, doing audio editing and, you know, starting to do more video editing now. I've gotten better at it. Sure. Right. You, you, it's like, you know, you put the hours and the time into it. Of course, you're going to learn a few things. And if our listeners or our viewers can do one thing to recognize the awesome job that Jeff's doing is like subscribe, do all those <laughs> things. Yeah. Do all that fun stuff. All right. Now we're starting to like get beyond where we want to be. We're over an hour. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up for this week. Um, Omri, thank you so much for being part of the conversation. Um, I'll have links in our show notes to to connect with you on LinkedIn. We'll have a link to Asserto, A-S-E-R-T-O.com. So you can check out more about that. I'll have links to the OpenID Working Group that we just talked about, AuthZen, as well as the Google Zanzibar paper, so people could check out what that was about. And of course, links to all of our discount codes and all that good stuff, and for Jim and I, uh, so you can reach out if, you, if there's questions, comments, concerns, complaints. Um, if there are complaints, send them to Jim. No, I'm just kidding. Send them to either of us. You know, we'll be happy to take the feedback. Um, and yeah, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. If you're watching this or listening to this on YouTube, do it there. We're on the web, idacpodcast.com, Twitter, X, whatever it's called, IDAC Podcast, Mastodon, IDAC Podcast at infosec.exchange. What else? We got our LinkedIn channel. We have our YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, connect with us any number of ways, but yeah, feel free to. Like and subscribe so you don't miss anything. All right, enough self-promotion. We're going to wrap it there. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.